We good? All right, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order at 1.48 uh, by the county clock. And uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Board Member Bennett? Here. Board Member Black? Here. Board Member Ed Edmonds? Here. Board Member Huber? Board Member Long? Here. Board Member Parks? Here. Board Member Ramirez? Here. Board Member Rollins? Here. Board Member Zaragoza? Here. Chair Pollack? Here. And we're at the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, Jan Dietrich, would you uh, like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Ready, begin. Ready, begin. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we're to item four on our agenda, which is the minutes from our last meeting, which was on April 9th. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. The motion, is there a second? Seconded by Mr. Zaragoza. All in favor say aye. Aye. As opposed, the minutes are approved. Um, any revisions to the agenda as posted? Okay, hearing none, we'll go through the agenda as it was published. Um, public comments. I have uh, some comment cards for specific items, so as we come up to those items, I'll, I'll call for that. Was there anyone that just wanted to speak in general about a topic? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to board comments. Any comments uh, from board members? Okay, looks like not, so we'll just keep on going here. So we're at item eight on our agenda, which is a public hearing regarding the adoption of the event. Ventura County Air Pollution Control District's proposed fiscal year 2019 through 20 budget. Mr. Villegas. Yes. Chair Pollock, members of the board, Mike Villegas, Air Pollution Control Officer, good afternoon. The district's budget is made of two components, the operating budget and the pass-through grant budget. Today I'm going to be focusing on the operating budget, which impacts our bottom line, but not going to be discussing in, in detail the pass-through grant budget where the grant expenditures are marked with identical revenue. This year we're looking at a total budget of nearly $17 million made up of an operating budget of $13.8 million and a pass-through grant budget of $3.2 million. I just want to note that under the accounting uh, professional standards we operate under, this operating budget is going to grow as the monies come in from the state during the fiscal year. As you're well aware, we provided more than $5 million in funding uh, late last year. Uh, staffing includes 48 full-time equivalents. This is one additional FTE from the current fiscal year. As your board's aware, we received substantial funding in our incentive programs. With this came administration funds. And with the substantial increase of the number of grants we're issuing in the past through grant budget, we also have additional fiscal reporting and compliance duties that we're going to have to take care of. The good news is this new incentive grant funding is going to cover the costs. So this additional FTE and the reclassification of one position will not impact our operating budget. Uh, looking at the net cost, and that's the one we all want to focus on, it's uh, near $6 million. However, $5.3 million is the conservative estimate for completing the renovation of the new office building. And when you back out three hundred dollars in contingency funding, we're looking at a net cost of $474,000. Uh, once again, uh, the district always budgets only $100,000 in fines and penalties and conservatively, uh, we, we go above 200000 So that net cost is coming down into the $300,000 range. And we have a couple additional funding streams that are going to be coming online uh, in your next couple board meetings with additional revenue coming in from the state. So I think we're looking at a very manageable net cost. And for the new members, we have gone, since I've been here, it's what's well, going to be 17 years. 
Every budget we've come for, we've shown a projected net cost. And at the end of each fiscal year, we've come back with a net savings. And that's the result of two things, really. Conservative budgeting, meaning that we always set aside money for failure of some monitoring equipment or computer equipment. And usually, you have less failures than that in a year. And the other thing is when positions do open up, it takes time to uh, replace that individual and there's salary savings inadvertently just associated with that. I don't expect those to be as high as they have been in the past year just because we had we went through it, a wave of retirements and when you just, you know, you overwhelm the capacity of HR and the district to fill positions. Uh, looking at the operating budget, uh, expenditures are going to be down by nearly 98,000, a revenue up by 70,000, and we have one increment request. Uh, the increment request is a very modest $25,000 set aside for electric vehicle infrastructure projects or some other type of motor vehicle emission reduction program. The interesting thing is in our operating budget, we're talking about the Assembly Bill 2766 DMV fees, which came with the California Clean Air Act. This is the $4 per vehicle registered in the county. This money was earmarked to implement district programs related to motor vehicles under the California Clean Air Act. So when you look at it, uh, more than half of our emissions come from motor vehicles. We basically run our monitoring program throughout the county, half on the DMV fees, half on stationary source and uh, federal grant, uh, you know, permit fees and federal grants. So, and this is very typical in other air districts our size. We have to utilize these monies to deal with the mandates such as developing uh, the emission inventory, which includes motor vehicles. So we do all of that work and outreach, EV programs, et cetera, are covered with these funds. That said, when, when you look at our pass-through grant budget, there is money that came under Assembly Bill 923. That's an additional to $2 that goes to incentive grants. And when we get to item 11, uh, staff will be letting you know that we're looking to a substantial increase into our EV charging infrastructure program. When you look at the expenditure detail, uh, down 90,000, 15,000 savings and salaries and employee benefits would have been substantially higher, but we did see another increase in uh, retirement contribution, and I'm just very pleased that I'm part of a county where the last report I heard was 88% funded, and that's really good news because I looked in the paper and saw that there are some local cities in the 60s, and that, that's not good news. Uh, service and supplies down by nearly $200,000. This is the potential rent savings if we move in on schedule into our new building. Uh, fixed assets are up by $116,000. Uh, this is some of the additional money we set aside in the building renovation as costs continue to creep up with material costs and contractor services with the recent demand for rebuilds with the fires. Uh, also, we're hiring outside computer help to work with the software update for our permit program that we're about to go live with in the next few months, and we need to replace one older vehicle. Uh, this is a slide that uh, the new board members looking at. You're not going to see the big difference from last year. Last year, salaries and employee benefits were 76%. But that big increase in fixed assets, that's the building renovation right there. So once that's completed, next year my take is there's going to be APCO here saying that 75 76% of the cost of salaries and employees benefits, very typical of any uh, technical type agency. On the revenue side, we're seeing a $70,000 increase from the current year. Uh, mostly, we received a small bump up in our monitoring grant from the US EPA. Also, money coming in to implement uh, AB 617, the environmental justice work, and we're going to be undertaking a revision to our asbestos uh, fee rule so we can better recoup the cost on that program. When you look at the revenue sources, once again, the big three are the DMV fees. That's the $4, 2766 money, uh, permit fees at $2.4 million, and our federal grant at $1 million. The 
the good news is we continue to meet all our mandates and we're operating with a smaller district than we had in the past. Uh, the fees and grants are not projected to cover the cost of all programs not related to motor vehicles. In other words, when you look at our permit revenue and our federal grant, it is not projected to cover all the costs related to stationary sources, but we are getting some additional funding streams in from the state, which is quite surprising to all the air districts, but it's good news. The other thing, like I said, is that's a projected net cost, and in the past, we've always come back with a net savings, and I think we're gonna come back, as we always do to scrutinize expenses, we can come back with at least a, a net zero. Uh, the good news, DMV fees, the $4, uh, those fees are stable. Uh, the only time we saw a significant drop in those fees was in the 07, 08 re uh, recession. I think people decided not to register some spare cars. And looking forward to next year, I would expect that the district will need to entertain a three to 4% permit renewal fee increase just to keep pace with the fact that both of the power plants will be going offline. Mandalay is already off. That's included in this budget. And Ormond will probably be online a year or two more until they can make the changes to the transmission lines. Uh, the outlook on the EPA grant is best is undetermined. Uh, the administration proposed a significant cut. The House, a uh, significant increase, and the Senate, a modest increase. So it's, you know, without a crystal ball, uh, it, it's hard to say where we're going to go in this. We basically projecting a small decrease in the future. So that, I think that's a conservative approach. Uh, I've spoke to my counterparts in both the blue states and the red states, and they think the grant's going to be stable through this Congress. Once again, we're utilizing the incentive program funds we received to the maximum extent feasible. Uh, we have an adequate fund balance to cover the total net costs, and we've conservative, we believe conservatively estimated the building uh, renovation with some uh, additional contingency funds at 5.6. Once uh, we get into that building, well, right now the building is acting as a, uh, a revenue source, but once we get in there that, and stop paying rent, that revenue source, that long-term tenant, is gonna help pay for most of our operating costs in that building. Uh, when you look at our fund balance, it was uh, 10.4, and that's the year of, that's the result of many years of net savings. And I think purchasing the building, renovating it, the district is gonna have quite a nice asset in terms of real estate. We've also got money set aside for fixed asset acquisition, uh, litigation. That six million is, is the net cost that includes the 5.3 uh, million for the renovation. And the, let me see, the 300,000 contingency and then the net cost I set up 474, which is actually, as we know, projected a little higher than we expect. That would leave the district with an unassigned fund balance just above the 50% target of reserves your board has set, the six months operating reserve target. In closing, at least for the next few years, what we've done is projected a modest fee increase, a slight decrease in the federal grant, increased retirement contribution, and we've conservatively estimated penalties on only $125,000 a year in this and it looks like for the next few years, the district's gonna be able to maintain the reserves uh, just above the upper target. And uh, I think looking past a couple years, we're, we're really guessing, but uh, that's all I have. I'll be happy to take questions. Questions from board members? Yes, Kelly. Uh, yes, um, I was actually wondering based on uh, your retirement, how we are doing with um, filling your big shoes. I haven't heard any updates or anything from that, and I know that is also a budget item. Um, so I just, just maybe you know, at a next board meeting that our members could be updated on that. I can give you a real one sentence answer. Uh, the standing committee is gonna be conducting initial interviews this Friday the 7th. Do we have a lot of applications? You had a healthy number, and you're looking at the cream of the crop. Great. It's going to be in my office. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I just appreciate the update. It would have been horrible if we got no application, so I hadn't heard. Thank you very much.
Yeah, and our plan is to bring our finalists uh, to the full board at our July 9 meeting. Yes, um, Mr. Ramirez. Would you just remind us when the, the move will happen, as far as you know? As far as we've been told March of next year, although uh, we just heard that there might be a, going through our second plan check with the city of Ventura, and, and there is the potential for a third plan check. So it just. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Richard. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so the EPA uh, grants are undetermined. How might that affect if they're greatly reduced? How would that affect that would operation? be a, We receive $1 million, so that would be a significant hit for the district. Uh, currently, like I said, the House and the Senate have increased that level uh, for the air agency. So for our, agents, our air agency, the share is $1 million, But right now, you, you've got this. <laughs> I wish I could tell what's going to happen with the administration and the two houses. But you know, we, we just can't tell. But you know, everything I'm hearing is Congress is not going to go along with a significant cut to the states and locals. And when you really look at where uh, EPA upper management, they keep talking about cooperative federalism, where we, we push the Clean Air Act work down to the states and have them implement it and make a leaner EPA, that sounds like you have to leave our grants at least stable. Yeah. Mr. Zaragoza. Yeah. Mike, and you probably said it because I was looking at something else. When is our new building going to be ready? Uh, we're, the last estimate I heard was March, although we, we have the potential for a third plan check, so that date could slip. So, so Mar March, I, I probably missed it when you said it, but uh, yeah. March, this coming March then? 2020, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right, um, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing, and we have some uh, public speakers. And, and if you're intending to speak and you haven't turned in one of these green speaker cards, now would be the time to do that. Um, I'll, we'll start with Russell Sidney. Thank you so much. Russell Sidney from Ojai. Really appreciate the, the effort you're taking with this and the consideration of our concerns. The details of my concerns are in the two emails I sent out in the last few days regarding both uh, greenhouse gas mitigation and electric vehicles. To summarize, please provide clear direction in the budget about dealing with the GHG mitigation. Having a program to create an e effective effort for mitigation would be awesome. Ms. Ve Viegas uh, just confirmed that there are funds available with flexibility from the pass through money. So that's really exciting for both GHG and infrastructure work. Uh, the, with regards to the electric vehicle infrastructure, uh, that development is, is an important part of the GHG work and is uh, something that a lot of EV drivers are working, including a number of yourselves, <laughs> to help make happen. Uh, we are all, all, all drivers dreaming of a time when the EVs take off and they go into exponential growth. And if we can provide the seed money, if we can provide the infrastructure it takes to get to that point, why uh, the multiplying effect of that could be humongous in terms of getting high carbon vehicles off the road. <clears throat> in the EV email, I go into the details about DC fast chargers. Uh, there's also a link in the report that goes into more detail about how DC fast chargers can be uh, the center of an array of charging that addresses all levels and all types of EV charging needs. The arrays become the equivalent of a full service gas station. You remember those, don't you? To support a wide range of EV drivers. I also validate the op-ed from the past APC uh, uh, officers in last weekend's VC Star. They did a wonderful job of describing the urgency behind all this uh, and the, the level of respect and professionalism certainly is most welcome on that issue. In addition to that, as, as someone who has been tracking agriculture since the early 70s and participated in it for a number of years, I, we just found out that almost 40% of the crops uh, in the Midwest have not been able to be planted this year in massive parts of the Midwest. That's a huge hit not just to the United States food supply, but also to the world. I haven't heard from the Central Valley yet. 
Fortunately, our own people are doing reasonably well, but we lost a lot of cherries and the strawberries are struggling, but I think we'll survive all that. The larger picture, more of a concern. So thank you for your efforts in this direction. Thank you, Mr. Sidney. Our next speaker is Ron Whitehurst. Hi, I'm Ron Whitehurst. I'm with the Ventura County Climate Hub uh, and um, really appreciate all that the, um, the um, Pollution Control Board has done over the years to help reduce uh, toxins in the air and greenhouse gases. And um, I would like to see in, in the budget a, um, some specific objectives, uh, projects, goals, and um, some uh, numbers, some target numbers that uh, would be good to, to reduce the greenhouse gas uh, that's out there. That um, we've got this, this technology for mitigating the carbon dioxide in the air. It's called a tree. And they also, in addition to mitigation, they also improve the quality of life in our neighborhoods and so on. So we'd like to see uh, some initiative to in, encourage um, planting more trees and other perennial vegetation on uh, county lands and, and to inspire uh, private landowners to do that. So there's a number of, of greenhouse gas mitigation efforts that we'd like to see you uh, do more of, um, especially uh, rebates for zero emission vehicles, expanded uh, charging stations for electric vehicles. Uh, we drive a couple of them and really appreciate it when we can drive up to especially uh, a destination spot, you know, like to, at the beach or shopping mall or, or um, uh, a park, you know, where we can uh, plug in and charge up and, and continue on our way uh, using electrons instead of uh, fossil fuel. Then um, we'd like to see um, the infrastructure to help uh, conversion of uh, gas guzzling electric cars to um, um, electric cars. And this has some tremendous opportunities as far as uh, workforce enhancement and so on, basically jobs. Um, then there's a lot of projects that could be done, uh, soil conservation projects on, on uh, working and agricultural land that you could foster and encourage. And then uh, retrofitting buildings for energy efficiency. Let's electrify everything, and then we, we can uh, figure out how we can produce this electricity from renewable sources. And then uh, it would be great to be able to have more trucks and to see there's a number of places where uh, we could in, in foster or inspire people to, to get into electric trucks and vans for delivery services and such. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, our next speaker is Jan Dietrich. So, again, I want to appreciate this district and all of its achievements in cleaning up the air. I think we can be particularly proud of, 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 of really decades of, of going to the max. And I just want to commend this board. I feel more hope from you, 10 people, than any other agency that I, I visit. And I visited many over the last five years in achieving the clean, or joining the Clean Power Alliance. And um, now I'm looking to you all. <laughs> I mean, I, I have visited the VCTC, and I just don't think they even know the climate's changing, frankly. And uh, all the other agencies and, and, and the draft general plan just right now looks like business as usual. And we need to be uh, thinking in a bigger way. And I see this budget process as setting, a, as a kind of like an opportunity for a climate action plan for the Air District. Uh, where we can, I'd like to see programs in there. I'd like to see like how, how the, the budget is allocated with metrics for greenhouse gas emissions. I, my reading of the detailed pages of the budget was 1.8 million 
uh, for greenhouse gas emissions reduction. So how, you know, and I think it was 1.6 million last year. So, you know, how, how is it actually gonna be spent? What are the priorities? So my, my mind goes to, could we create a, a committee for this or like a, and I'm, you know, I, I'm getting involved with the trees committee of the city of Ventura. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if the county even has a trees committee or an urban forest committee or not, Linda's saying no, but like, I'm actually thinking, let's call it what it really is, a carbon sequestration commission or something. That, uh, because the potential for drawing greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere is as big as stopping them from being emitted. And uh, I would, I, I'm, I'm gonna, this meeting snuck up on me, so I'm kind of off the cuff, but I've been using this plan as the, a really amazing source of guidance. It's, it's from the ARB, it's from the ARB, and it's the 2030 Implementation Plan for Natural and Working Lands. And you don't see air in it, but what you, and you don't see carbon in it, and you don't even see climate in it. What you see is multi-benefits, multi-benefits. And it's not just about mitigation, it's about equally everything you do now to mitigate is also a, a step for adaptation. And, um, and so I'd love to, I'll be sending more to you and I'd love to meet with you about these ideas of how this board can really take the climate action leadership to a new level in the county. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That was the last speaker card I had for this item. Are there any other speakers? Okay, seeing none, I will close the hearing. And this is the first of two hearings that we'll hold on this. So we'll uh, have another hearing on our budget at the next meeting. Were there any other board comments on this? I'll have a comment. I don't know if this is a speaker for this item, but the hearing's been closed. Uh, just this, I, I want to appreciate uh, the speakers uh, about um, requesting that this entity uh, look into some of these very worthy ideas. I, I, I have asked in the past, Mr. Villegas, to uh, comment on the charter of the APCD and if we could accomplish some of these things. I don't know if this is the right time, but I think those comments are very uh, near and dear to my heart about what we need to do to protect our health and our climate. And um, I know there's a lot of other entities that could also be involved in this. Can you just maybe briefly yeah, I'll just let you know that uh, at the last board meeting, we were, you know, there was a request to come back on the EV charging and certainly try to work at that from the greenhouse gas perspective. Also, there was a request uh, to talk about our other incentive programs and what we can do with near zero and zero emission projects that reduce, uh, when, you, when you talk zero emission, you're, you're reducing greenhouse gases basically to the, to the grid level. And we're gonna, that's item 12 today. And just lastly, there is, Sometimes there are intersections on this. When you look at uh, natural lands, uh, there's the potential that it could be looked at as, uh, when, when you look at soil conservation, that's something the San Joaquin Valley has looked at with uh, basically reducing dust, PM10. So sometimes we can find ways to get these two programs to work together. I'd like to participate in that. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Uh, also, uh, Ms. Vegas, talking about working together, uh, the Ventura County Regional Energy Alliance also is doing work, and I think they are also doing things towards electric vehicles. Are, are we in coordination? Uh, absolutely, we are. Matter of fact, our agency is just sending out a co-letter with them. Uh, the Community Environmental Council, the SARA, the Air Districts on EV charging, and actually a support letter also for uh, one of the transit operators in San Luis Obispo County committed to go 100% electric, so they're supporting them in grant applications. Yeah, I don't know if there's, a, I know there was a desire at one time to try to get them all mapped and um, also to have that map be updated all the time. And, you know, the, what they've got in technology now is just, you know, looking at, uh, you know, Tesla will actually tell you how many of the charging stations are being used before you even get there. So that kind of information, I think, encourages people who are wary about, you know, getting into the whole electric vehicle thing, you know, particularly if it's a completely electric vehicle. 
you know, having that information, something how IT in itself can assist, you know, a change in behavior like that. I don't know if there's any effort afoot to do that. In Actually, Denver it's County. either going to be June 18th or July 9th. We'll be coming with an item support. The community environmental counselor uh, wants to actually kind of, for the three counties, San Luis, Santa Barbara, Ventura, develop one website for the chargers. And, and we think that's okay. probably a good approach. And, and, then, and then taking up on that, uh, just the last thought was, when you got them all mapped, you also should have a priority in your mind, like where should we be putting them as opposed to, well, it's a, a public entity and they get the grant, you know, because we give them first to a public entity. But if there are other places, you know, where we see that there are holes or where we see the demand is so high and they need more, you know, th those kind of um, planning efforts for electric vehicle charging stations, I think, would help uh, yeah. also change that behavior. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things we talk about in, in the Basin White Control Council is the three districts are working together. You know, initially, I think San, Santa Barbara, San Luis led off with a grant. Then we handled a grant for the three districts. And now uh, I think Santa Barbara is running one for the three districts. So we all try to work together on that mapping throughout the, the 101 corridor. Real quick, Mike, you keep saying July 9th. I wanted to let you know there is not a Board of Supervisor meeting on July 9th. Oh, the next one is on July 23rd. Um, and I want to make sure you have a good attendance for that. So if you could just make note of that. Okay. Well, we'll try to get that going for the 18th. <laughs> <laughs> just want us all on the right calendar. <laughs> okay, any other comment? Yes, Ryan. Uh, I think what we heard a few times, and I think it was touched on uh, by Ms. Parks as well, is that you know, we have a, you know, it's a little bit of a field of dream situation, right? Let's build it and they will come. We want to make sure, I think there's kind of a, I mean, my personal opinion, I think it's shared by a few of uh, the board members that the, the more we can actively promote the infrastructure for electric vehicles, that's, that's what I think the, the starting point is to get people comfortable with going out and making a purchase and not having to stand there and think, well, well, if I want to go here and I want to go there, how far is it going to be and that. I think the website's a fantastic idea, how that gets integrated with uh, other types of media, social media, maps, waves, all those types of things obviously is important. I think that you know, the, the, the ways we can create that best infrastructure we can is going to be, if we're going to lead on this, the way we're going to do it is by building that so that people can feel comfortable to buy an EV and be able to get it where they want. And also, our location as a county in a whole, um, you know, people are coming up from LA, they're coming down from Santa Barbara, in between, it's definitely helpful that we have that kind of infrastructure in place so that people can, you know, make those changes and feel comfortable doing it, as well as the citizens themselves who live in the communities who want to have a place to do it. So I think that that's shared by everyone, and I think when you come back with that, as, as robust and as aggressive as you can be with it, um, I'd be interested to see how far we can go with starting that kind of process. All right, well, thanks for the input. Yeah, it's certainly something we want to do on the grant incentive side, and I'll be touching on that on 12. We'll also be talking about the light duty uh, program on item 11. Us, uh, and just a, a couple other thoughts, too, is one, you want to make sure that the infrastructure is working. And I don't know if we have any kind of monitoring. We're giving out grants, and they may go down, and they may not fix them for a month. So those kind of things, uh, making sure that, it, that it's up and going, I think, is an, an important aspect. And then also, I don't know personally if there are kind of superchargers for, you know, how long it takes to charge that car. Are there different levels where you can plug in and have it a faster yes. charge, and are we encouraging that? And Certainly, and that's what Mr. Sidney was talking to was the fast charge, what's called the level three, and those charging times are substantially better than the four to six hour on the level two. Level two is the most common. Uh, there is a fast charge that was placed by NRG at the Camarillo Premium Outlets, and when you look, that is one of those destinations. When, you, when you're in that parking lot, you notice there's a lot of license plate frames from outside the county. Same at the collection. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm glad to see that there is a collaboration working on it so that we can coordinate something and, and make it easier to get the information and to have better infrastructure. Yeah, I am. My, let me ask you this. How far, this is maybe a question you don't have an answer to, but how... How long are the, on the fastest chargers, uh, how far away do you think we are before there's a viable charging option that would be commercially viable for a gas station to be able to have there and charge somebody three or four bucks to be able to, you know, go for however, you know, and how, where, how, I mean, in five minutes or ten minutes, how long are we at a point where there's any viable? I haven't heard of the five or ten, but I'm going to check with Russell to see if anything that fast. No, no, it's not that. Electric America is getting 
pretty small numbers, but it takes a massive amount of electricity available. Yeah. The test of being the next level where you can get, what, 200 miles? Excuse me. The, the level three chargers generally in the Mm -hmm. It's almost um, it reminds me of the telephone booths that you don't really go and have a go to a gas station anymore. You just have to be driving to a mall, and there's a place to plug in. And they're talking about even doing it at the curb on on certain streets and that. So I I don't know what the model is going to be for the future, but uh, certainly having a, the companies willing to put them up, private industry willing to put them on their land too, I think is an important aspect. Okay, so we could you comment? Yeah, we're the, we're hearing you, but the folks at home aren't hearing that. So if you want to step up to the mic and summarize that. And while he's coming up to the podium, for those that don't have an electric car, I, I, and I've had one for a number of years now, I know Supervisor Parks has one, most, and, and so does uh, Carmen has a, a Volt. Most of the time you charge in your garage at home, and for most days that's enough to get around town. Um, but when you're going on a long trip, that's when it becomes an issue, and you need either destination chargers or en route chargers, uh, kind of like what Tesla set up. And we've been talking about uh, level three chargers, which are also called um, DC fast chargers, right? Correct. Uh, my name is Kent Bullard. I'm an EV advocate of Ventura. I was working with the Regional Energy Alliance on the EV readiness blueprint. As part of that, I did an inventory of all the charger locations throughout the county. I have touched them all. Okay, so we know that we have level three chargers in, in various areas. Um, we have the Tesla superchargers. We have about 550 ports that you can charge in the county right now. Those are mapped on PlugShare and with the Air Alternative Fuel Data Center with DOE. And that is an important tool because it does show areas that are lacking in community support for EV charging. And that's what we need to build on. Okay, thank you. And we'll, we'll hear more about this at, at our item number 11. Yes. Okay. I can probably, yeah. I can save the comments to item 11, so because yeah. I know you're going to be discussing the same thing. Yeah. Okay, we're so we're still talking about our our uh, bud budget, and if there's no other comments, we'll. I'll move on. to approve. I'm sorry. Move the recommended action. Yeah, we no, no action needed. We're, we're not. This is the first of two public hearings we're going to hold in the budget. Oh, we don't need to, we don't no. need a motion. You're closing the public hearing, and then you'll reopen it again on the 18th. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Take it back. Okay, item nine is receive and file the new source review annual report regarding rule 26.11 emission reduction credit evaluation at the time of use. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a little detail. We have uh, three new board members here today. New source review is the program that applies anytime a new facility is proposed to move into the county or an existing facility wants to expand their operations and has two requirements. First, best available control technology. And that's just what it sounds like, meaning if you were going to bring a new business into this county, it needs state-of-the-art emission controls to get a permit from us. That said, even with emission controls, there's going to be some emissions increment. That increment, uh, that increase in emissions needs to be offset using emission reduction credits. Now, it gets more complicated. There's a federal new source review program that applies to large facilities and the California program that applies to all facilities subject to our permits. California law requires that when you bank these emission reduction credits, you make sure they're surplus or they exceed all emission requirements. So you're only allowed to bank something that exceeds our rules before they go into the bank. Federal policy, which applies only to large facilities, 
means that the credit needs to be surplus when you bring it out of the bank for the offset. And what that creates is uncertainty for the permittee and the credit holder because you really don't know what the credit's worth until you propose to use it. Our district and a couple others in California have established equivalency programs. And basically, as long as we can demonstrate to the EPA that our offsetting program is just as or more stringent than theirs, we're not subject to this requirement that credits be surplus at the time of use. So in the real world, what it means that if there was a large facility uh, coming into, into a county or a major modification of a large facility, they would not be subject to the federal surplus at the time of the use. They would still have to use emission reduction credits uh, subject to the California program, but they would get some form of regulatory relief. And it also provides some assurance to the credit holders that what's in the bank is really there. Uh, in real world sense for you, uh, the only major sources we had proposed in, the, in recent history are, were the two power plants. And my estimate is they would save in the neighborhood of six figures on the purchase of the emission reduction credits with this. And I'm happy to let you know, once again, we've demonstrated that we're equivalent or more stringent than the federal program. That's all I have. Okay, any questions from the board? Mike, do you, do you need a motion on this or can we, it's just a it's receiving, a receiving file. I'm sorry? It's a receiving file. So unless there's no objections, uh, we'll just uh, receive and file it and go to item number 10, receive and file a status report regarding odor complaints in Southeastern Port Wyneme neighborhoods. Well, the slide should be up any, any second now. Yeah. And what I wanted to let you know was uh, that this really tells the story right here. And when you look at, you see uh, in the lighter blue, you see the Surfside condominiums right above that. In the darker blue, those are the hideaways. And in the red is the bungalows. Those are in the city of Port Wyneme. When you look circled by the yellow, you've got the wastewater treatment plant right at the top. And it would be kind of in the... Uh, Upper left-hand corner, you see the little square box. That, that's the headworks. That can be a source of odors. And down where you see the uh, four tanks near where, where the it dog legs out just a touch, those are the primary tanks. Uh, across the street in the green outline is New MD uh, paper products. Great. Give you a quick lay of the land. What happens in the afternoon is generally you get an onshore wind coming out of the... Uh, Southwest, so that'd be from the corner where you have the Google Earth logo. And generally, that's going to take the odors away from the home. But what happens late at night and in the very early morning hours is we can have very stagnant conditions or we can get a slight wind out of the northeast, so blowing exactly the opposite way, and that can bring odors to the home. And the other thing with stagnant conditions, sometimes the modelers refer to that as uh, fumigation, where just the odor kind of just moves out from the source and you can pick it up and there's no wind to take it away. Uh, our investigation has been ongoing and it's, we put in a lot of effort and we're still working on this. Uh, I spoke to several inspectors that have inspected both facilities. Uh, their history is when you're at the wastewater treatment plant, you're gonna encounter some strong odors as expected. When you're at the new Indy plant, uh, it's been described to me as light odors. Uh, just recently, we had both our engineering manager and our planning manager out there, took a complete walk through the plant. And it's been described to me a couple different ways, wet cardboard, and one inspector told me, it's like when you open the box up, when you buy your, your kid a new bike and you open the box and you get that kind of that cardboard odor. That's what it smells like. And what's different here is, I think a lot of people, they look at paper manufacturing, and when you, you Google it, you, you read a lot about the craft pulp mills in the Pacific Northwest, and they have really strong odors because you're making white paper, for, for instance. Here, they're making that, what they call the flute, and that's that paper board that's kind of that sinusoidal wave in cardboard. They're not actually manufacturing the cardboard at Port of Wainini facility that's done at another location, so that really cuts down on the use of any adhesives. Uh, staff has reviewed uh, the chemicals utilized at New Indy, and we have not identified any odorous compounds. Uh, to conserve our resources, what we're going to do is we've looked over the complaint history, and we've looked over the MET data. And what we're going to do a couple once or 
twice a week, we're going to have our inspector go through the neighborhood with the homes, early morning hours, and if they detect odors, they're going to run to both plants to see, you know, identify the source. Uh, if they don't detect odors, they're going to go off on their usual inspection business because we've got a lot of other work out there. The good news is we have seen a recent decrease in odor complaints. Uh, that's good news, but I, I kind of attribute it to two things. Recently, we have cool months. People are sleeping with their windows closed. Two, and that's going to change in about 30 days, most likely. Two, the city of Oxnard, you're going to hear from uh, their staff from the wastewater uh, division today, they've been adding what's called ferrous chloride up on the trunk line, one of the trunk lines feeding in. And this ferrous chloride basically breaks down hydrogen sulfide, which is the rat, the rotten egg odor mm -hmm. gas. And I think that's made a big step in improving things. Uh, we just met with the Wainimi Foundation. Uh, uh, I asked him at the end of the meeting, you know, what are, I said, this is what my inspectors tell me. They're saying, you know, I had to say where the odors are coming from. Now I'm 80-20 I'm wastewater treatment plant, New Indy, or 90-10. And he said, that's kind of my take, too, from running around. Although he has some interesting data we need to look at. And one of the things we are going to look at, he has detected some ammonia. We need to find out why that is. You know, ammonia, can, I'm the guy that cleans the cat box at home. I can tell you one place ammonia comes from. But we also want to make sure that we're looking at New Indy also because we, one thing I want to look at is uh, there was just a, a point he brought up with me on boiler maintenance that we want to look that could possibly be linked to a, a you know, periodic uh, smell. But we'll be looking into that. And the other thing is we are going to develop an updated complete toxics inventory for the New Indy facility. That concludes my remarks. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions. We also have uh, Oxnard Wastewater Division staff here. Any comments or questions? Yes, Mr. Rollins. I have a series of them. Um, I have a series of them. First of all, I want to thank the, uh, the County Board of Supervisors for waiving the fee and uh, Ms. Long for waiving the fee for that so that we can get a better uh, handle on this situation. I know Robert Brommer is like, providing the uh, funding for a lot of these different sensors. Um, um, as far as the complaints that I've received from the community, from what I gather um, is that for a period of time, the Indy uh, plant was doing some construction, and so they limited their ongoing operations, and so there was a marked reduction as far as, like, the complaints that were coming in. However, um, as early as three days ago, I, uh, there's a um, social media next door that comes through. And basically, I've um, received a whole series of um, concerns, uh, everything from um, uh, 4 a.m. And this is to confirm a lot of this is happening early in the morning, 4 a.m. Uh, now, it feels like a jet, no, jet taking off. Uh, the sound of the equipment going on. Uh, we are nauseous, have to keep, we have to close our windows. Uh, still, st uh, this is also early, uh, 7.45 in the morning. Noxious, nauseating fumes, keep your windows closed. Anyway, there's a whole series of those types of things. Um, there, there, as far as like, you know, Oxnard's effort, as far as like you're know, moving um, where they enter that chemical to reduce the fumes. That has had a remarked uh, improvement. So I want to commend like the uh, city of Oxnard for making those steps. Uh, however, uh, there, there seems to be a continual concern regarding the Indy plant, whether it's substantiated or not, that seems to be where the focus appears to be now. And, um, but again, I want to thank um, you for like, you know, making this a, uh, a high priority as far as investigating it. Absolutely. And, and like I said, we're going to continue to look at, you know, with that updated toxics inventory, we're going to look over the boiler maintenance issues. And, you know, the, the loud banging noises we've heard, we just, you know, we, their operation doesn't have, <laughs> we're just not sure. We don't know if that's, a, you know, a truck trailer backing up, and sometimes you get that really loud. Believe me, when people had condos behind the old uh, Home Depot in Oxnard, we heard a lot of uh, complaints about that kind of, you know. It, 
I, I would just say that, you know, personal, because I actually live in one of those complexes. Uh, my son jogs on a regular basis late in the evening, and he's come back and reported to me uh, a, little, a lot of those incidents regarding the loud noises and also the fumes. Uh, he, he had a different way of describing what those fumes were. However, it's clear that, like, I think maybe the operation gets in full stance late in the morning, uh, late, I mean, the early hours of the morning or not. And maybe, as you had mentioned earlier, you're going to have your inspectors kind of do some late night shifts to sort of yeah, check we've done that the, out. The, the late night one in the morning, but we looking at the weather data, we think we're going to be good if we get in the 637 range, we're going to be sitting in pretty good weather conditions for finding the odors. Well, and I would ask uh, where or what email or what phone number should people call when they do have those complaints so that it would be documented for AQMD? Where yes, we have a complaint. I don't have it with me off the top of my head. We have a, on, we have a complaint hotline. Also, the city of Oxnard has one, and we do right. touch base. Okay. I just want to make sure that people know that there are locations in which you can do that. When I know you follow up and I follow up and Supervisor Zaragoza does, but just to make sure that people know there are locations in which we can track this information. Okay, any other comments? Are we, are we going to hear from Oxnard staff? Let's hear about that. Mr. Hauser's here. Oh, certainly. Division, the wastewater division. Be great. Thank you. It will be coming right. It will, okay. Okay. Good afternoon, board members. How are you? Good, thank you. Please introduce yourself. I don't think everybody knows you. Yeah, my name is Jan Hauser. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm the uh, Oxnard Wastewater Division Manager. Uh, I've been on the job about nine months, and uh, so <laughs> thank you. I'm still here. Uh, so yeah, this is one of the uh, you know top priorities that we've been working on, among many other things. But I also uh, this this will advance it. Okay, thank you. Also want to uh, introduce Tian Ng. He's the Assistant Public Works Director is with us today, and so is Ray Trevino. He's the Collection System Manager of our system. So uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys about this issue because it's near and dear to our hearts because it's where we work and live. And so uh, we want to be good neighbors, and that's our goal. And, and we understand uh, the frustration of people next door. So I have a, a, a real, I'm here to talk about our odors, as we know, it's not as exciting as electric vehicles, I'll tell you that, but but again, it's a it's an incredibly important issue. So uh, just real quick, I wanted to start with a little background. The plant was built on this original site in the mid 1950s, so it's been there a long time. Uh, and then we saw a real spike in complaints at the in the middle to the end of last year. Uh, I've gone back in the record to the greatest extent I could find uh, over the last 10 to 12 years. And n at no time did we see the level of complaints that were, we saw at the end of last year. So everyone has asked me, you know, what changed, right? Uh, so nothing has changed on our side that we could find. The plant has been operating the way it's operated for many years. And so it's a very odd thing. Uh, and it's a real challenge for us to get our arm, arms around. It could be a number of things. It could be the weather. You know, people talk about the changing weather. Last summer was very hot. We got more offshore breezes last year than I think. And Mike, I don't know if you're looking at stuff like that also, but uh, social media is a big thing. Next door, people get on next door and, and they band together, right? And so that's, and actually we welcome that because we, we can't fix problems if we don't get feedback and don't hear from people that are impacted. So we actually appreciate that. So that, that was the big thing. Now, as, may, as many of you may be aware, we went through a uh, master plan process and a rate increase, a, a, a rate study and rate increase back in 2017, and uh, got approved for a, uh, a number of capital improvements over the next five years. And a couple of those improvements directly relate to the, the odor issue. One is uh, we, we have a scrubber at, Mike mentioned our headworks, which is a source of odor. We have a scrubber there now. We are increasing the size of that unit. And so we will be able to capture <clears throat> more air out of the headworks and, uh, and reduce any f uh, odor footprint we may have there. So that's really important. That has, well, I'll talk a little bit about uh, where we're at on that project. 
Uh, and, and, and Mike also mentioned our, what is a sewer, uh, a chemical injection in our sewer system. That was originally driven by odors at one of our pump stations, right? And we've been doing this uh, project for a couple years. We used one chemical at first, which took care of the odors at the pump station, but we've now started in January, and you'll see how that relates to uh, some of the complaints we've got. Uh, we started a new chemical in January, which now changes the chemistry of the odor-producing agents, the sulfides. It actually binds them up and takes them out of the system. We can run that all the way to the plant, so it's actually helping us with odors at the plant. And we are just about to sign a, an extension to that contract where we're going to look at other uh, potential chemicals that will work in conjunction with this, which is ferrous chloride, uh, at the plant itself to further reduce odors just through chemicals, no capital improvement. So those things are ongoing and approved in our budget. Uh, so real quick, I don't I'm not going to, this was just for location and Mike already went over that. So our, our progress, the chemical addition pilot program, I talked a little bit about that. The analytical data shows incredible decreases in uh, the amount of sulfides we're seeing at the wastewater plant. And that again is the odor producing uh, constituent at a wastewater plant. I'm sorry, am I going the wrong direction? I can't go backwards, Mike. You can't, it's forward. Sorry. Now I, uh, okay. Can you do it? That was going so well. I really, personally, I really appreciate your presentation today. I think it's extremely important that we're all on board. Yeah. Commissioner Ramirez, thank you also yeah. for making sure that this so is uh, heard back? by all of us. How do I go back? Mm -hmm. I I'll have a comment, if you don't mind. <laughs> I apologize. I'm going to have to leave in just a couple minutes. But I do um, want to thank Mr. Hauser and Mr. Yang for being here, uh, along with uh, Mr. Rodriguez, because uh, it took a lot for our city to get that wastewater rate update. You, some of you might remember what our city and uh, I and my colleagues went through, but it's very important to have the funds to do these things. And I know it's not perfect yet, but we're working on it. So um, stay tuned. Thank you, Mr. Hauser, for being here. Yeah, so I'm sorry I got out of place there. Real quickly, I'll, I'll be real quick about this then. So, so that's working very well, and we're going to continue to expand that chemical addition program out in the system, which we believe will help. We've also uh, are in construction. It's almost completed what we call a chemically enhanced primary treatment, which is another facility that will add chemicals that will improve settling in the, prime, the open primary tanks that Mike also mentioned. That should uh, help reduce odors. And finally, the, the odor scrubber uh, that I talked about is designed. It's going through plan check right now. It should be bid depending on funding, so we're still working on securing the funding. Uh, should be bid either late this year, or early next year. So we'll have that in by hopefully by some sometime next year. Uh, finally, other things we're doing: we we are right now in construction on the replacement of all the the basically the equipment inside our clarifiers, which are the round tanks on the left. So a, a source of odor are the weirs where the water overflows into uh, into uh, a channel. And where you get turbulence, you get odors. So we're, gonna, we're looking at covering those, and that should be a, a huge improvement. We're also just doing some stuff ourselves. And, and the thing on the right is just covering some of these boxes with carbon, activated carbon, which, which again absorbs these odors. So we're doing things uh, ourselves that we, we hope we'll see, see results from. Uh, again, so what we did when the, when the odor complaints increased significantly at last year, we formalized how we track these things. So we got our GIS department involved. We have our, so we have a 24 hour hotline and people can call at four in the morning and our guys will go out there and they'll check to see if there's odors and they put it in their phone and it comes up on our GIS system. So this is an ex a snapshot of uh, what we see and how we track it. So these are odor complaints since about uh, uh, November of, of last year. So it's ongoing. Uh, it's kind of a neat tool. Uh, here's an ex this is real data of our complaints. So it's summarized. So you can see it starts in November. This is monthly complaints, 48 in November. And you can see we started uh, the chemical addition in January, at the beginning of January, and we've seen a steady decline. Now, with that said, that only went to uh, 
didn't get last week of May. We had a number of complaints last week, so that would that number would be higher. But it looks like we're seeing results, right? Uh, so anyway, you know, we're committed. The city of Oxnard is committed to working with the neighbors and, and working with the uh, agencies to solve the problem. We have an open door policy. We give tours, so, so we give tours specifically for the Surfside residents. They can come over any time. We've done two, there's been about 30 people. You're all welcome to attend. Or if you want to have a tour of the plant, please do that. I just so, want to say I went to that tour and it was very informative. Did you? Oh, you were there, very good. Yep, appreciate it. So again, it's an open door. Uh, we're gonna to continue to work on these improvements, okay? So just because the complaints are going down doesn't mean we're stopping, right? We're gonna continue working through this. So, and then again, the question is, there's our odor hotline, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, Christmas, as TN likes to say, Christmas, New Year's, we're coming out. So anyway, thank you all very much. I appreciate it and uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you, any further questions? Yes, and this PowerPoint, will it be online or is there information similar to this online in the city of Oxnard? Because uh, I've been on your website before and I really appreciate the information of the update of what's going on. Yeah, this there. presentation is not even though it can be and we will okay. do that. I just, for transparency, the numbers, to make sure. The numbers for the hotlines are, right? Yeah. Pardon me? The numbers for the hotline are? Uh, uh, the city website? Yes. They are? Okay. Oh, yeah. The numbers yes. for the hotline are published. Okay. Right. Yeah, I just, it's just good for the community to know that you are doing upgrades and so right. forth. So whatever we can do to share the information. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it. All right. If there's no objection, we'll consider that received and filed and move on to item 11 to receive and file a status report regarding the Ventura County Electric Vehicle Charging Stations Infrastructure Program. This is continued from our April 9 meeting. Good afternoon, Chair Pollock, members of the board, Ali Ghassemi, APCD Manager for Rules and Planning. Uh, the item that I have before you is a status report on EV charging station infrastructure in Ventura County, which was a continuation from the last board meeting. It has, there has been a lot of talk, interesting talk regarding EV up to now with the charging station. So I'm gonna give you a brief background of how, when it started, how, where we are, and what is the future plan. In 1990, California Air Resources Board adopted the zero emission vehicle regulation, which uh, requires the auto industry to uh, actually for electrical vehicle cells in the state of California. Then, as a result, the first set of EV charging station was installed in the county in late 1990 and early 2000. Then in 2003, the California Air Resources Board actually repealed the rule because due to end the litigation which was filed by uh, auto industry, and the reason for that was because the, no, the, there was not enough interest market for the EV actually vehicle. So, and it was because of the high sticker price or a low mileage. Then that led to development of hybrid, uh, hybrid uh, actually vehicles, which became very popular and everybody started buying it because it had a, it had a high mileage and there were about like six million sold. Then in 2009, California Air Resources Board actually adopted a new zero emission vehicle, which requires the auto industry to have some, like by the 2018 model, they have to produce about 3% and they increase it to 16% for 2025 models and beyond. In two, the initial Ventura County APCD grant actually was issued for six EV charging stations in a county and uh, that was um, the budget for this grant actually, the, 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 it was approved by this board on June 3rd, 1997, exactly two years and one day uh, from today. In 2012, Ventura County APCD actually restarted another, like a grant program, which provide actually to assist with publicly accessible uh, electric charging facility, uh, 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 charging station in Ventura County and the budget from for this in the grant came from AB 2766, which was a $4 DMV fees, as Mike explained previously. Our uh, future plan is actually to continue with the same grant using the AB 2766, which is about $25,000 per year, 
and also we we are going to expand significantly our EV program by using the money, the incentive money from AB 923, which is a $2 DMV fees. And staff currently is looking into the mechanics of how we're gonna go through the bidding process for this because this is a part of the requirement of health and safety code. However, I wanna point out that recent EPA Safe, the, uh, re, the safety affordable fuel efficiency regulation had actually created some uh, uncertainty. And because of that, staff is working with California Air Resources Board to make sure actually that the money that we're gonna spend is gonna be wisely used. Also, another thing that we are looking into is we gotta make sure that the federal incentive tax program is still we're gonna continue because that's another part of the uh, EV charging station being actually installed continuously. There are currently about 8,000, actually I just heard that about, it goes about 10,000 uh, uh, plug-in vehicle in the county and we have more than 500 EV charging station in the county. And since 2012, Ventura County APCD has been a member of the plug-in Central Coast. This is a, actually a group that they are pooling resources together to for the EV charging station planning and installation. I'm done and I'm ready to take any question you may have. Any questions? And we have we, and we have a couple of speakers on this as well. But but go ahead and ask your question first. Well, the um, how how many of of these grant projects are grant money that's just given you, that you just work directly with the city versus with any developers or any new construction that's going on? Have any of the grants ever been utilized to say if there's a new building going in, a, a new apartment building or a new condo complex, something along those lines, mm -hmm. that they would be uh, used to make sure there's EV charging? Yes, I think it was uh, last board mm -hmm. building or before we cre actually j make a grant agreement with uh, authority, the Ventura, Ventura County Authority, the, yes, they have, a, it, Yes, it is uh, actually in EJ community, and we are actually uh, providing more than, like we, the first grant was about 12,000 something, and then they requested for more money, but we are coming back to you in July, I guess, or no, actually June. Uh, well, let me ask this then. So uh, there's been, what, one project out of one all One project that I am yeah. aware of. Is there, would we get more value out of the grant dollars if they were, you know, if we were partnering with different types of developments where they were extending the grant, you know, they were matching the granting or something along those lines to increase we, the number of total chargers? Actually, the, the way the program is set up right now, we are paying for the purchase of the equipment, is the, actually the, the EV chargers, and the, uh, the, the grantee is paying for the installation. That's how this, the program is being set up. Okay. It's not matching. There is no matching or anything. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Sure. Okay, we have a couple of speakers. Um, I'll call up Kent Bullard, as our first speaker, and after that we'll be uh, Thank feel you. good. My name is Kent Bullard. I've been a resident of this county for 30-some years. I drive an EV. I advocate for sustainable transportation. Um, I was working with, or still am working with, the Regional Energy Alliance on the EV readiness blueprint. Um, the things that, that we need in the county are more electric vehicles and more electrical vehicle infrastructure. Now, majority of people who own EVs, about 94 to 96%, but in the numbers, charge at home because they get a better electric rate and the car's always charged up and ready to go. Where we have a Difficulty in implementing EV adoption there are places where people live in multifamily homes or rent and they can't get access to the electricity. And that's where we talk about level three chargers in multifamily home areas or disadvantaged communities. If we had more level three chargers, let's say in the plains of Oxnard, out along the 126 corridor, places where people who have an EV can go and get a quick charge and continue about their, their daily business, we'll see a lot more adoption. So there is a recommendation that in order to meet the governor's goals, we actually implement up to 30 EV fast chargers in the county per year um, until 2025. And so we really do need to be looking at where those EV chargers go. 
Um, hopefully, the grant monies through APCD that are matching, they buy the equipment, the installer provides the infrastructure support. You got to have the money in the APCD to do much because with $25,000, you're going to get the equipment for one fast charger. So we got to have a lot more money available, and that's where I think that the funds from the clean air DMV registration fee should be applied more towards EV charging. Um, and, and one thing I did with the Regional Energy Alliance was I mapped and inventoried all the chargers and does allow us, mm -hmm. the county GIS division is pulling that together with the Regional Energy Alliance, but it really does show where we need stuff. The 126 corridor, again, gets mentioned often because if you live out that way, you have access to the Todd Ranch Jail, which most people really don't want to go to, <laughs> or there's a Chevy dealer in Fillmore that only allows you to get fuel for your Chevy vehicle. So if you buy any other vehicle, you are stuck. There's nothing out that way. So we really need to take care of those communities and improve our access to EV charging. There are six other APCD units in the state that provide monies through the EV charging, uh, EV readiness, anywhere from $1,000 to $3,000 per, ve per vehicle through grants, and that can be done here. We need to do the same thing in this county. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Bullard. Uh, Gil Good is our next I, one. I also want to thank you. That's really good information to have, to be able to look and give us that analysis, like where are the holes so we can focus our energies on that instead of just over, you know, the whole county wide, but look where it's most needed. I was also wondering, I, I know there are some programs to assist lower income people to get electric vehicles. Because um, I, I don't see that there may be as much demand in apartment buildings, for example. As far as the purchase of an electric vehicle, the um, clean air rebate program has a larger incentive. If you buy a fully electric vehicle um, and you're a, a medium or higher income person, you get um, about $3,000 and it's up to $4,500 to $5,000 for low income. Unfortunately, the low income was you apply for it and they were oversubscribed and until the monies are re-released for the next <laughs> cycle, people won't be able to get in access to that monies. Yeah, I, th I think there's uh, other, is there also another program, kind of second generation car or, you know, used cars? <laughs> if you, really it's for new vehicles, but if you're an Edison customer and you drive an EV, new or used, um, before it was $450, it jumped to $1,000 after January 1st. So if you're an Edison customer and you buy a newer used EV, there's $1,000 in your pocket. Okay. Mr. Good. Thank you. So I've also uh, been an EV driver for uh, quite some time now. For about six years, uh, I was driving plug-in hybrids which means I had a gasoline engine to back me up, but I found that 90% of my driving was all electric, so now I'm trying to drive all electric. The main thing that happens to any of us um, is the thing called range anxiety. Um, will I be able to get back when I go someplace, or will I be able to find the charger to plug in? Uh, and at this point, just as an example, uh, Thousand Oaks Mall has installed a number of chargers uh, whenever I go there, I find that they're all filled, and people just last you know, stay there long enough that it's difficult um, to plug in when you're there, which means that, you, that you're seeing uh, a significant increase in the number of people driving electric uh, and not enough chargers coming along in order to uh, accommodate it. Uh, the whole thing with electric charging is that uh, it's a combination of... of um, uh, legislation to implement all of it, to regulate all of it, and then the effort by private industry to develop the chargers and bring units in that will, that will be efficient. Uh, the cost of chargers is significant, especially looking at level three because you need that additional infrastructure to get that 400 volt unit that's in there. Uh, there is actually at, uh, at least one company that makes a portable unit that could be put out in the middle of a parking space uh, someplace, as long as there's sunlight to charge the batteries in their unit. Um, 
there isn't any problem for, you know, for people charging up. Um, one of the things I looked at is if you look at some of the pictures of uh, foreign countries, you'll find that where they have uh, on, uh, on street or like curbside parking would appear to be um, uh, meters, uh, meters for, you know, just parking meters, they're actually charging stations. So someone could pull up, plug in his car for uh, whatever time he's in a store. Think about the, imp the implementation of where you need level two or where you need level three. If a person goes to a movie theater, uh, he's going to be in there for a couple, three hours. Level two charging is fine. If you're going to go to the supermarket or a Home Depot or something like that, where you're in there for a short period of time, the quick charge really um, serves a lot better purpose because the, um, you can plug in and before you know it that you're done. Um, but I think, I think that the, uh, the combination of battery development, um, which, is, which is allowing for cars to go even further, uh, and even newer types of batteries uh, other than lithium ion are going to contribute greatly to the viability of having uh, electric vehicles. Um, but uh, legislatively, it makes a difference as to whether or not the, the programs are there, uh, the regulation is there so that um, uh, uh, there's a system for, uh, uh, you know, for doing all that. So. I see my time's up. Great. Thank you, Mr. Good. Thank you. And I, I know I had that same experience having owned a Chevy Volt for about six years with about 40 miles of range on the battery, and it was always a challenge to try and get through your day without having to resort to the gas engine exactly. that's on it. And the only reason I didn't buy another Volt is because that would have been revolting. Yeah. I mean, I got, as much, I got as much as 65 miles on my Volt, uh, which is why it was, you know, pretty good for going places. Oh, yeah. Um, no, it's great. I wish more people would uh, take it up. And now there's the Chevy Bolt that a lot of people are switching to, which yeah. is 100% electric. Thank you for your testimony. Much okay. appreciated. All right. Any other board comments um, on this item? I, yeah, just one that the Ventura County Regional Energy Alliance is partnering with the County of Ventura, and they're hosting an electric vehicle lunch and learn on January 12th at noon here at the Government Center in our multi-purpose room in the Hall Administration here. So they're even going to have refreshments so you can learn about um, all different kinds of things regarding uh, the types of vehicles out there and charging and get your questions answered. So it's nice to see uh, that information is going out to our employees and the public too is well, most welcome to come. And just Mr. Villegas. Real quick. That you Okay, so we're on item 12, Noon. receive and file a status report regarding the Ventura County Air Pollution Control District's incentive programs for zero emission and near zero emission projects. Yes, uh, this is an update your board requested on our work with our existing incentive programs for zero emission and near zero emission technologies. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with uh, the grants we receive from the state is basically they've told us get look at cost effectiveness and you target heavy duty diesel and i know that's given some folks heartburn when you see the amount of money going towards the diesel projects and the limited funds going to the electric vehicle projects and just kind of to let you know that as these additional funding streams have come in for diesel projects we have been matching the moyer using our ab923 two dollar fees which are earmarked for incentive programs but recently, they added another option, and that is to use it for EV infrastructure as long as we go out to a com competitive bid process. So with all this additional diesel money coming in and the fact we had actually been overmatching in the past, just trying to get as many reductions as fast as possible, means we now have some of those $2 fees that we can move into the light duty EV infrastructure uh, program. That said, now I'm gonna talk about the heavy duty side of it. Uh, one thing we wanna do is we have to keep in mind that we're still non-attainment. We've got a design value of 78 PBB in Simi Valley. We need to hit 75 by the end of 2020 and then mid probably, it's, it's still you know approximately 2026, we have to hit 70. And that means we gotta be as cost effective, we gotta make every dollar count in reducing ozone forming emissions because the emissions throughout the county on the prevailing wind go to the inland portions of the county. 
The other thing to keep in mind is why is CARB giving these monies is that when you look at the risk from ambient air, two thirds of the risk is driven by diesel particulate. So one of the things we wanted to do is we've been very successful at doing egg pump engines, tractors, et cetera. We wanna open it up now because looking at AB 617 with environmental justice concerns, you got elevated asthma rate, uh, potentially in the Oxnard region. We've opened it up to locomotives, and the reason there is we've got two older locomotives on the Ventura County Railway, 1976-1980 vintage, uh, what we call a tier zero, uh, zero emission controls, mechanically controlled, and we're going to be receiving grant application for the locomotives uh, to go to a tier four electronically controlled diesel with catalyst. We're going to see a significant NOx reduction, significant diesel particulate reduction, and these trains go right through the heart of the disadvantaged community in Oxnard. So we wanted to open it up with that. The other thing to keep in mind is when you're moving freight by rail, on the efficiency of ton per mile moved, locomotives beat heavy duty trucks. So you're getting a, a climate change benefit in that side, and then the electronically controlled engine are better with fuel economy. What we're really focusing on is potential zero emission electric trucks and near zero emission that's certified to a voluntary uh, NOx emission reduction 90% lower than the current diesel standard for trucks, especially operating in disadvantaged communities. So we've already reached out to people about electric trucks. We've heard interest back on natural gas trucks, which are certified to that voluntary uh, level. And I realize that natural gas isn't as clean as electric, but it does eliminate the diesel particulate. The other thing we're looking at is expanded battery charging under the Moyer and the Moyer-like programs, such as uh, community air protection and alternative fuel fueling stations. Generally, this is going to occur in conjunction with an operator moving over to electric or natural gas. Other thing, very exciting, just heard that we were out at a meeting at Ocean View on uh, electric school buses, Ocean View District in South Oxnard, Wainimi. It's gonna be receiving two uh, battery electric buses. Oxnard uh, School District will be receiving three, and we're certainly gonna analyze whether they need additional assistance on infrastructure. Uh, the other thing is sometimes, you know, that's kind of the bus is coming and we need to get the charger, and sometimes it's the other way around, the Port of Wainimi. They were successful in getting a grant from the California Air Resources Board to again increase electric infrastructure on the produce wharf. That opens us up to look at things such as electric yard tractors, electric cranes. So these, these are uh, big benefits. And lastly, we are going to be reaching out uh, to the community, taking input on these projects. And you know, we want to hear back from the community, especially in disadvantaged areas. We're hosting a workshop, uh, 6.30 p.m., June 11th, Oxnard Main Library. And we'll be reaching out to all the environmental, environmental justice groups, the neighborhood councils to get their input. And that concludes my presentation on this item. Okay, comments, questions? Ms. Parks. Uh, this is a great idea, you know, we're always like trying to put in, if uh, projects are going to go forward, that they are uh, non-polluting as best as we can, and, the, and it makes sense that it would be in disadvantaged communities. Um, I'm hearing from other areas that are actually conditioning new development and um, ones that create pollution like uh, fossil fuel oil pumping and things like that requiring them to be in 100% energy, a clean energy, whether it's CPA or it's SCE. Do you know um, if that is a something that we could be looking at, if that's a legal, uh, maybe it's more something for the county to look at, but I know some cities are, are doing that as part of a, a mitigation yeah. or causing pollution. I, I think that, that certainly does have a, Something that we should be discussing with county council and, and the county of Ventura, especially with the uh, RMA, with the planning side. Uh, just one thing to everyone remember, our oil field drilling uh, regulation basically urges people to go electric. And basically when you look at what we consider best available control technology, we consider that electric motor at any oil well where power is within reasonable access. So 
in essence, that's kind of that program right. implemented to, through a district rule. <coughs> get them away from diesel if we can. That's right. Yes. Uh, Mike, I, I, I kind of already know the answer to this, but I want to reiterate it. In the hierarchy of what we can do to do the most, have the most impact we can on air pollution in general, I think from what you said is number one is removing diesel, and number two is getting the, you know, if it's number two, but the electrical infrastructure and EV charging, as important as that may be in the long term for a complete solution for uh, air pollution from vehicles, from gas-powered vehicles at all. But in the short term, the, the biggest bang we can get for our budget is the removal of diesel in any way we can. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct with all, most of the money that's coming in for the state because it's when we receive that money, there's grant conditions, and we use it according to those regulations. But that said, like I said, now that in the past we've been overmatching, that's going to free up some of that matching money to make a significant dent on the light duty EV infrastructure side. Sure. Thanks. Just uh, in that comment too, and going to electrify, you know, like electric vehicles, unless we do the uh, requirement that what's charging the electric vehicles is also clean energy, we're not necessarily ending that cycle. So. I really like that aspect of requiring at some point that it's 100% clean energy that's running the electricity. Okay, any other questions or comments? We have one public speaker, uh, Russell Sidney. Thank you for the opportunity to speak again. Uh, just a couple of quick comments about getting away from diesel. There's the, the two most immediately available uh, routes to making that to renewable fuels includes the electric school buses, which I totally support Mr. Villegas' interest in that, uh, particularly since so many communities have got the 100% renewable electricity option. Uh, the second one that is, uh, and school buses will, will allow large fleets to be able to see how to manage those vehicles, and the amount of time they spend on the road makes them ideal places to start because of the uh, less demanding range and uh, uh, things that, that reduce uh, b battery capacity. The other low-hanging low fruit is what has been happening in the trash industry. The, there are, have been a number of tests of utilizing the biogases coming from uh, landfills and from sanitation districts where they are converting uh, the emissions into fuel and allowing the trash companies to utilize those. So that is a step, uh, taking a step towards uh, CNG, starting with the trash haulers would be a good one because of the uh, possibility of transitioning into renewable biogas from there. Uh, that would be an immediate step, and that is also one reason to consider uh, supporting the CNG, which does have, some, have a much lower greenhouse gas uh, uh, content than even the cleanest diesel. So, uh, just a couple of things with re regards to that. Uh, and then there was something about your question. Remind me of your question again about what was that last comment you made, uh, Supervisor Parks? Well, the question I was just asking was regarding having the electric charging stations get their electricity from 100% clean energy. Uh, yes. And right. uh, whilst I totally support that, rest assured that research for the last five or six years has well, even longer, has shown that even with the California grid, we're still looking at 65% reduction in uh, or more on any of the pollutants, including greenhouse gases, even without going 100% renewable. And that was mm -hmm. from a long time ago, so we're doing really good yeah. on that level. And then, and then being able to condition new development to be 100% clean energy to mitigate oh. their um, impacts. But I know we're, we're running, I think, late <laughs> because yeah. we have thank another so board meeting, but thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sidney. If there's no more comments on this item, we'll move to item number 13, receive and file a comprehensive audit for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2018. Yes, our external auditor, auditor Vavernick Trine and Day, completed their comprehensive audit for the district for fiscal year ending June 30, 2018. There are two reports, the comprehensive annual report and the single audit report. Uh, the single audit report is required as we receive a federal grant from the U.S. EPA under federal regulations. Once again, the audit did not find any material weaknesses in our financial systems. And as the executive officer, I'm really pleased with the results. And I want to commend uh, Nancy Mendoza and Leonie McAreg on their excellent work on our fiscal systems. And that's Thank all you. I have. 
that 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 is impressive because I've, I've been on boards where it wasn't as impressive so it's very nice to that we have a very competent financial staff to make sure that happens any comments i'm sorry oh, wait, i don't think we need a motion for this we'll just unless there's an objection we'll consider it received and filed unless you need a formal action I didn't think so okay um item 14 is received and filed the minutes of the south central coast basin wide air pollution control council meeting of august 22 2018 we can just, Mr. Vegas. Just, we, we can just move that there. Okay, that's okay. We'll consider that received and filed. Item 15 is receive and file a status report regarding the Air Pollution Control District's application for a Section 103 grant from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And this is just our standard grant for our air monitoring program. Okay. All right, terrific. Any comments or questions on that? And we'll move on to our last item, which is our correspondence um, agenda, item 16. Anything just want to note that uh, certainly the district uh, we're in there supporting Gold Coast Transit in their recent attempts to acquire uh, electric buses. Okay, terrific. So we'll consider that received and filed. And that's the end of our agenda. So we will adjourn until our next meeting, which will be on June 18. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.